Do you ever wonder why your home, office, neighborhood, or even the city that you live in looks the way it does? The built environment is a combination of many things from the past, present, and future. And in the field of architecture, design is all about the remixing of the lessons of what have come before. And if you're looking to understand the architect's mindset, then I welcome you to today's discussion where we're gonna go into how architects think to create innovative architecture. And we're gonna dive into a five-part discussion that goes into some key theories that have shaped our built environment. Part one is functionalism. Part two, contextualism. Part three is about sustainability. Part four is digital technology. And part five is an interesting section on the design thinking movement. And to kick it off, we're gonna begin with functionalism. Now this theory emphasizes the practical or functional aspects of a building rather than the decorative or ornate features. And functionalism emerged in the early 20th century as basically a challenge to the, the ornate decorative styles that had come from the previous centuries. And the basic concept that they put out there was that innovative architecture needed to be efficient, practical, and serve the functional purpose for that which is intended. And this led to the ever popular phrase by Louis Sullivan, form follows function. And often the functionalist theory is associated with modernist architecture and the international style. These styles are in themselves associated with architects Le Corbusier and uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Now the reason that this uh, movement was able to be possible in the first place happens to be with its time in history. And that was because there was an advance in technology, science, and the industry is itself. And in particular, this was because of the, the, the new materials that were available for the architect's tool set. You had steel, glass, and reinforced concrete that allowed larger open spaces to be able to create some, some open area buildings rather than the, the heavy masonry buildings that had come prior. And by means of the process, functionalism also is associated with this notion of standardization and modernization because it is on the, the cusp of the Industrial Revolution. And that meant that buildings could be designed using standard elements that could be replicated and easily assembled. And this led to cost efficient construction and adaptability and flexibility within the building floor plates themselves. And a recent example of this style was actually a newly discovered and constructed building by Mies van der Rohe in Indiana University for the Eskenazi School of Art, Architecture, and Design. The original design was done back in 1952, but the project was recently discovered and constructed just a few years ago. And look out for a future video where we'll go behind the scenes on that project in the process, as it's something that I actually was working on. Now, theory number two, contextualism. Now, contextualism emerged in the mid 20th century and it seeked to move away from the standardization and uniformity of modern architecture. And what this theory suggests is that innovative architecture should be more site specific and relating to its context. And this meant that designing a building should take into consideration factors like the topography, the environment, climate, local vegetation, and of course the surrounding building and landscape. And additionally, this theory suggests that innovative architecture should be sensitive to the physical environment in our social cultural context. And one of the most well-known examples of contextualism is Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. And the big takeaway from this design is you can see that the, the building itself emulates the natural context and site in which it sits. And as an architect who's also formally versed in the language of landscape architecture, I am a big fan of this approach. We should be designing to our, our local physical environment. We should be uh, respectful of the local culture. And additionally, we have to consider sustainable and environmentally responsive approaches to design. And design theory number three is about sustainability. And this theory highlights the critical nature in which we need to design buildings to be able to provide sustainable options using materials and technologies that are basically going to minimize our impact on the planet. And this approach is uh, increasingly important as we're beginning to see the impact of climate change and the construction industry in general is one of the biggest influences. So we need to look and start at home essentially for how we're gonna create positive change. And the key principles for sustainable architecture is that design should minimize its energy consumption, use sustainable materials and construction techniques, and promote the health and well-being of its occupants. Now, when we talk about minimizing our energy consumption, this can be done through a few different strategies. One, we have passive solar design. 
So this uses natural orientation of the building and uh, captures stored solar energy. It's a very elementary piece rather than going into our active like HVAC and air conditioning systems. And now for sustainable materials and construction techniques, we need to look and specify items that are not toxic to people and the environment in which the building lies. Additionally, we need to think about the embodied energy to be able to create the materials that the buildings are constructed out of. And for the construction techniques, it's critical for us to think about how we can reduce waste and even the upcycling concept to where if we were to take something like a material like wood, being able to continuously forest and plant the, the resources that we know we're gonna end up using. And of course, we need to, to think about the reduction of pollution and what we're doing to the natural wildlife habitat. And when it comes to the health and well-being of us and other occupants in a building, sunlight goes a long way. Vitamin D is good for, for everybody and fresh air being able to come through is always a positive thing as well. And we can see one large scale example of this in the Sonoran Desert in Tucson, Arizona. At the University of Arizona, there's the natural resources building that was designed by Richard Kennedy Architects. And if we look at the innovative expression of the building facade, we can see that it weaves in a way that is beautiful and aesthetic, but the functional part of what it does is it provides shade, but at the same time, we're allowing natural light from all throughout the complex. And then the cavernous effect of the courtyard area allows for this microclimate of natural vegetation that to grow and lush. And bear in mind, this environment only gets about 11 inches of annual rainfall, so not much. And all of these native plants, rather than invasive or non-native plants, are just living by means of natural rainfall. And this is a lovely example of sustainable architecture. And if you're ever in the chance or in the area of Tucson, Arizona, I highly recommend go take a visit to this space. You won't be disappointed. And essentially the takeaway from the sustainability theory is let's reduce our negative impact on the environment to create a healthy place for us to live, play, and work. And next we're gonna talk about digital technology. And this theory suggests that innovative architecture is achievable through means of 3D design, which allows collaboration amongst colleagues and disciplines. You have parametric architecture that can help us create complex forms and shapes that we never would have been able to do before. And then we have computer-aided fabrication methods. And digital technology is a relatively new movement. Uh, and by new, I mean the past couple of decades, but it has allowed architects to be able to fabricate buildings that were once impossible. Additionally, we can test different design options. We can run analysis for solar, wind, seismic. We can look at our energy calculations. There's so many options that were not available to us in the past, but now we're able to do this essentially to be able to create and assess the performance of the building before it's actually constructed. And what is most exciting about the digital technology theory and movement is that it has enabled us to be able to find some new construction techniques that are creating a more sustainable future. And this is through means of um, technology such as 3D printing and fabrication. And for example, there's an amazing 3D home printed community that's currently under construction uh, in, uh, just outside of Austin in Georgetown, Texas. So this 100 home community, it's fabricated on by 3D printer and printed out by Icon 3D is the company. The builder is Lennar, and then you have the, the designers or co-designers as Bernard Engel Groups, who's a very creative firm out of Copenhagen. And the future of this technology is really exciting. And I recommend you check out Matt Riesinger's video where he goes into in-depth interview with the, the fabricators and designers about this project out there in Texas. Now, the final theory today is about the design thinking movement. Now this approach to design is generally intriguing to me as it focuses on a human-centered approach to the design process. And we're gonna further discuss this theory in this video over here. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in that video where we'll talk about architecture for people, the design thinking movement. Anyways, thanks again and I'll see you later.